All right, we're picking back up in the, the end times prophecy series that I started a few weeks ago. And um, what we're we'll focusing on this evening is mostly just um, events that are going to be following the rapture. I'm not going into God's wrath being poured out at all, but just some other things. Or there's, I was looking at some of these issues that I think some people get confused on or maybe have questions about and they don't really know a lot about it, but they're not necessarily topics that I want to preach an entire sermon about. So we're going to cover a few of these issues tonight, just, just help maybe to, to provide a little bit more clarity and understanding of some of these events that are going to happen. Because, and oftentimes, you know, the most interesting stuff, it seems to be, is the stuff that what's going to happen next, right? The tribulation, the rapture, the antichrist, these things, and I think rightfully so, probably get a lot more attention than some of the rest of the, of the prophecy in Revelation. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to be focusing on the last few chapters of Revelation for the most part tonight. And look at, we're going to look at who the 144,000 are. We're going to look at the Battle of Armageddon and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb and uh, the Great White Throne Judgment, the Millennial Reign of Christ, and the New Jerusalem, the New Heaven and New Earth. So those are going to be kind of the things that we're, we're talking about tonight. And we're going to go through it pretty well chronologically. Uh, the first sermon I preached was just an overview of the book of Revelation. So we didn't have time to go in depth on pretty much anything in that sermon because I was just really trying to, to nail down the, the timeline of events as they occur um, and, and looking at all those, those passages in Scripture just proving the, the timeline. So, but now we're going to dig in a little bit more towards that, that last portion of, uh, of that 70th week, Daniel's 70th week. So this is like, like right near the end, just prior to the millennium. Uh, so we're, we're, we started off here in Revelation 7. And I think, I don't know if there's anybody more confused about Revelation chapter 7 than the Jehovah's False Witnesses. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, I don't, I don't think you can, you can take this out of context or butcher this anymore. I've never actually heard someone try to give like any actual explanation while reading the scripture as to why it is. But if, you, if you're unfamiliar with it, and, and this, is, this is a little bit of advice anyways, when you go out soul winning, one of the most common things that, that I say when we go out is you ask someone, hey, if you were to die today, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? Very common opening statement. You're asking somebody. If I know prior to asking that question that someone's a Jehovah's Witness, I don't ask them that question because I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail because what they believe is that if you're saved, you don't necessarily go to heaven. They believe there's only 144,000 people that go to heaven. And that what they're trying to do is be the best Jehovah's Witness that they could possibly be to be one of those 144,000 that actually makes it to heaven. Everybody else just gets to be on the earth if you're saved. And if you're not saved, you're just annihilated. It's like, like they believe in like the soul sleep or it's just you're here one moment and then poof, you just cease to exist. You're just gone. But everyone else just gets to live on this earth. And basically what they do is they prepare people for the kingdom on earth and just, okay, well, just get prepared because you're probably not going to be one of the 144,000. So just, just be prepared to be spending eternity on earth. And, it's, and I'm not going to go, you know, I'll, I'll dedicate an entire sermon at another time against <laughs> the Jehovah's False Witnesses. But um, yeah, it, it, when you look at this, it, and it's funny too because we see very clearly here, look, look down at Revelation 7. We're going to reread a little bit. I'm not going to read all of this for, for sake of time. We just read the whole chapter. But verse number one says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any uh, tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So in the timing of everything, this is the start, the, like, the starting of God's wrath being poured out. It hasn't happened yet. The tribulation is just finishing. It's just getting wrapped up. The tribulation is done. The rapture is going to happen. And then God's going to pour out his wrath. And at this moment right here, he's saying, hold on a second. Don't pour out any wrath yet because there's these 144,000 that need to be sealed in their forehead that are not going to be suffering God's wrath at all. 
I mean, the Bible says that God has not appointed us to wrath, right? And his children, and these people are saved as 144,000 of, of the Lord's servants are going to be on the earth. And he's just going to make sure that they don't suffer any of the wrath that God pours out. So he's sealing them in the form. But what's really interesting here is it says in verse number four, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they're sealed in 144, 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then it goes down and it lists of the tribe of Judah were 12,000. And it lists 12 tribes. And it says there's 12,000 from each tribe that are getting sealed. Now, when it's being that specific, going down to the tribe, because we know and we believe here in what's, what's so-called replacement theology, that um, we believe that God has stopped using the, the physical Jew and the physical nation of Egypt. Uh, Egypt. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is now. Spiritually, it's Egypt. The physical nation of Israel to, um, to be the lighthouse and to shine forth God's word and, and, and everything. And he, and he finally, he took it away from them. He said, give it to a nation, bring forth the fruits thereof. So, okay. And we see the references to you know, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but he's a Jewish one inwardly. And we see that, that we believe that we are Israel. We are of the commonwealth of Israel. If we're born again, if we're saved, if we're in Christ, we, we, we have that. But that is not what this is referring to here, because if it was just referring to a, a spiritual Jew, which, which we all are who are saved, it's not going to talk about the various tribes. It's just going to be talking about Israel in general and the promises made to Israel and every, you know, in, in, in that type of faith. So, um, this is literal Jews. And turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 14, because these are the only two places that you're going to find the 144,000 mentioned in the entire Bible is in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. So, and I'll just read for you, you know, we read the whole thing, but after it lists all the 12 tribes, in uh, Revelation 7, verse 9 says, and After this I, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So that's like the rapture. That's when everyone gets raptured up. Just, when, just as they're, you know, these 144,000 are getting their, their, their foreheads sealed to be sent down to the earth, the rapture happens because God's going to pour out his wrath. So that's a timeline of events. Revelation 14 Verse number one, we get a little bit more information about who these 144,000 are. We know that there's 12,000 from each tribe being selected here. But look at verse number one. The Bible says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they, look at this, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the 144,000, not only is it 12,000 from each tribe, but it's 12,000 men, because they haven't been defiled with women, and they're virgins. I have yet to hear an answer <laughs> from the Jehovah's False Witnesses about this. Yeah, because they're striving to be one of those 144,000 people that actually get to heaven. Are you a Jewish male virgin? Because <laughs> if you're not, you don't have any hope of being 144,000. I'm sorry, if you're not of the tribe of Gad or Issachar, or Reuben, I mean, and you're not a guy who's a virgin, then I'm sorry. Oh, you have a wife and kids? Sorry. It's not you. Can't make it. Might as well stop going out and knocking on doors and spreading your blasphemy right now because you're not going to be one of the 144,000. But you're also not going to be on this earth either. 
Unless you repent, you're going to be, you're going to realize that hell is a real place. Again, that's a sermon for another time. So, obviously they've got some, some messed up um, beliefs. But we do see here that they are, they are virgins. They are, they are men. They're, they're, um, they're of these tribes. And they're sealed with forehead. And, and I believe the purpose is here, which is why they said that the angel flies in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, is that their job is just going to be, they're going to be glorifying God. They're going to be preaching the gospel and just saying, hey, you know, while God's pouring out his wrath, there's still 144,000 men that are going to be down there preaching, preaching the gospel. I mean, we're not going to be there anymore. It's after the rapture happens. So God, you know, supernaturally sending people down there still to be able to make sure that the gospel is being preached. And I, I didn't even have this. I didn't even think about this before. But they're stupid. Um, they got the, the pre-trib rapture stuff. When, when they talk about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and they use the wording of like, but he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed and stuff. It's, and they say, oh, that's talking about the Holy Ghost, and see, the Holy Ghost will be taken out of here because we're all going to be raptured out. If the Holy Ghost is taken out, no one else is here, who's going to be there to, to preach the gospel to people? There's going to be nobody. But when you actually look at the, the way the Bible outlines everything, there isn't a time where there isn't somebody to be able to preach the gospel in God's timeline of things. If the Lord's not willing that any should perish, then why would he just take everybody out and just say, okay, well, forget it now. I mean, I could see what he's doing if he's pouring out his wrath, but they call the, the tribulation, and the, I mean, they just put the whole thing together and saying that even the, the wars and, and everything else that's going to be going on. I mean, what about the people who haven't even taken the mark of the beast yet? Like, you don't want to try to give them the gospel? No, the Lord does want to still give the gospel even when he's gotten to the point to where you haven't gotten saved yet and he's going to start pouring out his wrath, he's still preaching the gospel to him. And that's what we see the job of these 144,000 are. Now, I think for a long time, many people get confused about that. And I've been confused about this in the past too because it's like, well, where are these, where are these 12,000, you know, these 144,000 male virgin Jews going to come from? I mean, like today, nobody can claim to be from the various tribes. So one answer could be like, well, God knows. Well, yeah, but I mean, what even, can, what even constitutes being part of those tribes anyway? I mean, they've been so intermingled. Yeah. How could you possibly say you're, that anyone's from this tribe and have it mean anything? I mean, I could be from the tribe of Benjamin because somewhere at some point, somewhere down the line, there's one person in my family tree that physically descended from, from the tribe. I mean, I, you know what, does that really make me of the tribe of Benjamin? I don't think so. I don't think that would be a proper usage of, of you know, the way, what, the, way the, the Bible's outlining his people here. So, um, if we look at the wording, though, and jump there, and we're in Revelation 14, look at verse number three again. It says, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne. So, it says before the throne. Where are they? Where's the throne of God at this point in time? It's in heaven. It's not on the earth. God didn't set up his kingdom yet. The rapture just happened. So they're singing, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, right? The four beasts, the elders, the throne of God, they're in heaven. These 144,000 men are in heaven. It also is clear because later is when Everybody, you know, the rapture happens just after they're sealed. So it's like they're not coming out of the great tribulation. They were already in heaven. I believe he was talking about saints, believers, people who have already believed on the Lord and were saved because people have been getting saved all throughout history that lived in the past that were of these various tribes. That that's, they were of the tribe of Judah. They, you know, who knows exactly how long of a history of the time span that God is it has chosen these various men to represent him on the earth? Don't know. There's not, the information's not given. But I think, it, I, I think in order for everything to fit properly, it would have to be people from Zebulun and Simeon and stuff that were around during that time that were saved and that were virgin and, and you know, loved the Lord and probably, and did, probably did great works for him. Just various men throughout history that had done it. And now they're being honored to have this opportunity. Now, it also says here, so 
we see where they're at. They're in heaven. It's not like they're on the earth and he's sealing their foreheads on the earth. They're in heaven and he's sealing their foreheads to send them down to the earth. And it says, and no man could learn that song, the rest of verse 3, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. They were redeemed. They not are redeemed like now. They already were redeemed from the earth. Verse number 4 also says, these are they which were not defiled with women. It's past tense. These are, you know, everything that they're using from them is past tense. It's already happened. They were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whether it's you go with. These were redeemed from among men. Look at this. Being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not claiming to know the in and out exactly of the first fruits unto God, uh, to the Lamb. But was, I'm guessing it's probably very early on in the tribe's lineage if they were the first fruits unto God um, and to the Lamb. So very early on, these, these men were redeemed from the earth. They were virgin. I mean, and for all we know, they could have died when they were infants or baby. Oh, who knows, right? Does it, could, it could be anything because that, that would put them in that category, right? They're virgin, they're male, they didn't, you know, and they've been, and maybe they've been doing a great work in heaven this whole time, right? And maybe that's how they earn their spot. I don't know. But it's easy to see what they're not. And there's a lot of people teach all kinds of different things about this. I think it's very, it, it fits in very nicely to know that, okay, these guys were around before, 144,000. It's not, we don't have to be looking for the 12,000 from the tribes and like right now as if the rapture is going to happen that they'll be the ones. No, they're already in heaven right now. They're already serving the Lord in heaven and they're, and they're getting ready to be sent down um, when God's going to send them down. And uh, one last point here because there's another, another point that just, just kind of popped up is just this, and again, kind of more of along the lines of another sermon for another day, but the, dispens the hyper dispensationalists that want to tell you there's different gospels for different time periods, and they'll say during the tribulation, it's a works and faith based gospel. Nope. And that's, that's what they teach. But look at what verse number six says. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Look, the gospel is everlasting. It's been around since Adam. It's been around from the beginning of time, yea, before even the creation. The gospel is eternal. There is one gospel that saves. One gospel that saves. No other gospel saves, no matter what time you're in. Works have never saved anybody. I don't care, and, and they're never going to in the future. We are not good enough. And it's that simple. Never have been. Never will be, at least until we receive our new bodies and we're in heaven and there's no more sin and everything's going great. So um, anyways, that's, that's the 144,000. Let's jump forward now. I'll jump to, to Revelation chapter 16. Just in case there's a little bit of confusion, hopefully that clears up with a little bit for you. It's not, um, you know, and, and that's about it. I mean, those are the two places we see him. So we see God, he's sealing their foreheads, getting them ready, sending them down. They're going to preach the gospel. What more do we need to know? Right? This is who they are, and, and this is their mission, and this is what they're doing. So I'm not looking to attain unto one of the 144,000 because I'm not a Jew, I'm not a virgin, and I'm not in heaven. So, <laughs> so there you go. Now we're going to jump forward a little bit. And like I said, we're going to skip all of the wrath being poured out. Because that, at that point, that's the beginning of God pouring out his wrath when he's sealing the 144,000. We also have the two witnesses. I'm not going to go into them uh, tonight. And we're going to fast forward to Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon. Armageddon is the battle that takes place basically at the end of God's wrath being poured out prior to Jesus Christ setting up his millennial kingdom. Okay? So in Revelation chapter 16... Verse number 12, let's look at the, the scripture here. The Bible says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, 
and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we see this is the, now the, the, you know, and again, we fast forward as you could read the whole chapter in context later. We're jumping into this there at verse 12 and it's saying that the, the rivers have dried up in order to make a way, like a path for the, for the kings of the east to come in and being prepared for this battle. I mean, this is like, uh, he's basically drawing as many, as, as many forces as he can of the men of the earth at this time who have survived through the wrath to fight against God. Because the devil knows the plan. Uh, the devil knows what's going to happen. He's the one leading this. He's the one in charge, the Antichrist. It's not like any human being on earth is, is coming up with these plans now to, to fight against God because, I mean, it's just kind of silly. But the devil does, and the devil is. And that's why he's even gathering them together because he's going to fight against them in, that, in Armageddon. So it says here, uh, verse number 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth, keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. That's the last vial. It's the last plagues. You know, like everything is done now. God's done pouring out his wrath. And verse 18 says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, fast forward here in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19, because this sets the scene in Revelation 16 for Armageddon. The battle's ready. You know, the devil's gathering up his, his, his hosts, his, his armies to fight. And then, you know, the, the, the vial is, is poured out and these last plagues are being poured out. Babylon's brought into judgment. And then in Revelation 17 and 18, we already did look at those chapters. That's describing Babylon and Babylon's judgment. You know, so the, 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 in the overview of events here in, in Revelation, it sets the stage and then kind of magnifies Babylon and just goes into a lot more detail for chapter 17 and 18 before we pick back up again in the chronology in chapter 19. So we, we're not going to go through, we already, I already preached on Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. So go to Revelation chapter 19. Verse number 11, the Bible says, And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in, his, in, excuse me, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So now it's where Jesus Christ is on his horse, he's on a white horse. That's his, you know, he's called Faithful and True. Um, and he's going to judge in righteousness and make war. So they're gathering themselves together to battle. And Jesus Christ says, okay, you want to fight? I'm ready to battle. And he comes on his white horse. Verse number 12 describes him a little bit. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So in case you're wondering, like, well, how do you know that Jesus... His vesture was dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. It's Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So, the rapture's already happened, right? That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. He comes in the clouds. We're caught up together to meet him in the air, okay? This is now, after wrath has been poured out, he's coming to establish his kingdom. So, this is his third coming. 
I mean, it's not commonly called that. I don't know why, but it really is. I mean, it's just because people get so confused about the second coming and they, they mix up verses of, of, of the timeline of events. This is his third coming because he's, now he's coming to the earth and he's going he's gonna to actually establish his kingdom. He fights this battle. He overthrows the Antichrist, right? And he's coming to rule, the Bible says, with a rod of iron. Throwing off the notion of the, of the hippie Jesus that's, all, that's a pacifist and all about peace. He, he's coming to fight a war and he's saying, I'm going to rule the rod of iron. And it's going to be my way and that's it. And there is no arguing. There's no debating. There's no voting. He's the king. Mm -hmm. It's not a democratic republic. Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom. He's going to rule with a rod of iron and says he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. So the, the angel is basically saying, all right, bird, you know, you animals, birds, get ready, because there's going to be a great slaughter. Because there's going to be men's bodies all over the place, and you're going to feast really good. You're going to feast on kings, on all these people who, you know, and it's illustrating the, the, the pomp and the pride of these kings, even willing to fight against God, and they're so lifted up, and he's saying, you're going to be brought down and birds are going to be plucking your meat off your carcass because it's, it's hopeless to fight against the Lord. Verse number 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It's not even really a fight. See, what's, what's interesting about this is that Jesus is coming with his saints, right? And I believe we're going to be riding on horses with him going into battle, and we're not even going to have to do anything. Because he's just going to destroy all of them just with the sword that comes out of his mouth. With the, I believe with the words that come out of his mouth. He's a, I mean, the same way he's able to create the heavens and the earth by speaking into existence, he's just going to destroy the armies of the Antichrist and the beast and the, and, and the armies of the earth that go to actually go forth to fight against him. And um, just a few things to, just to maybe take with you and to keep. And when you're remembering the timeline, Armageddon is the battle at the end of the wrath. It's like right at the end of that seven-year period. And um, it's the starting point then of the millennial reign of Christ. Keep your finger in Revelation. We're going to come back here to, to chapter 20. Go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, we're going to start reading verse number 22. The Bible says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ said is coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now, before I even go any further in 1 Corinthians 15, I don't even think I reference this verse in any of my other sermons because we've been mostly dealing with Revelation, but isn't it interesting how everything just, I mean, how perfect the Bible fits together. He gives us the order. It says, every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruit. So Christ was the first one to be resurrected from the dead and glorified. 
Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming, those that are saved, when he, you know, at his coming, his second coming, when, he, when the rapture happens, is when we will be resurrected. If we're dead, if we're alive, you know, we'd be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And then, and then cometh the end. So at the end of everything, there's going to be one final last resurrection. So um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So we're going to come back to these verses a little bit. Go, now go, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20. This is referencing the order and Jesus Christ reigning and ruling. It's a millennial reign of Christ. And when he's done reigning and ruling for a thousand years is when he's going to deliver the kingdom back to God. Because God's in charge right now. God the Father, right? Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven right now. He is not the one in the authority in charge as far as the Godhead is concerned. God the Father is. When Jesus Christ sets up the millennial reign on this earth, he will have the authority. He will be ruling and reigning. And then at the end of that thousand years, he's going to return that power back to God the Father um, who will be in charge. And that's, that's what we see here in 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to see that also in Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 20, this is after the battle of Armageddon. Jesus Christ comes. He, he wipes out. Oh, the, the other last point I wanted to make on Revelation 19 with the, um, at the battle of Armageddon. This is when the beast and the false prophet, part of the unholy trinity, you've got the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. And... Um, they're cast into this lake of fire. Now, I know when we go out soul winning, it's, it's, it's easy and it's not necessarily inaccurate. It's just not very complete. You know, if you use Revelation chapter 20, um, talking about the second death and this is the lake of fire. It's that, the lake of fire is separate from hell. Um, they're two different places. Hell exists in the center of the earth right now. The lake of fire is also referred to as like outer darkness. It's just a place off by itself. We don't have a whole lot of details to it, but it's essentially just like hell because it's a lake of fire and people are going to be tortured and tormented and burning there. And the first people that even go to that place are the beast and the false prophet who are, who are just cast out into outer darkness. In Revelation 20, we're going to see at the end of the chapter that hell is relocated from the center of the earth because the earth's going to be destroyed and going to be transferred to the lake of fire. So when you're explaining people and giving them the gospel and you're showing them the judgment and the lake of fire, I mean, what people commonly understand is hell. You don't have to go with some dissertation on the difference between hell and the lake of fire. I mean, it's the same concept. So, you know, I always try to be careful to word it properly. But since hell is going to be, you know, people are going to be in hell forever, by the way. Because when you go to hell and hell is relocated to the lake of fire, people are cast in the lake of fire, they're going to be in hell. So it's not, I mean, it's not inaccurate. And the Bible does talk about, it, you know, everlasting fire and everything of hell. So again, it, it, people want to nitpick at this stuff and I, it's just foolishness. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, look at verse number one. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So because in Revelation 19 at the battle of Armageddon, when Jesus comes back and defeats all the armies, that's where the beast and the false prophet are, are, are the first ones to go to that lake of fire. Verse number one, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So now here is a reference to the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is referring to hell. It's a pit. If you think about not just a pit as in a hole, but the pit is like the, you know, at the center of, a, of, an, of like fruit, right? You have a peach and you have the pit of the peach is in the center, right? And a bottomless pit, you think about being in the middle of the, of the earth, there is no up or down because you're in the center, right? I mean, everything is, is up and down. It's this bottomless 
hit. It's, you know, you think about the way that, that gravity works, we're all being, there's this force on us holding us to the, to the top of the earth. Well, in the, in the center of the earth, what is there? It's going to be this probably like a sensation of just always falling in this bottomless pit. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but I know that, you know, you're going to be in this, in this area in hell, in this bottomless pit, and um, that's where the devil is going. The, the beast and the false prophet cast in a lake of fire. Satan is going to hell for a thousand years. It says he's bound. He can't go out of there. He's stuck in hell for a thousand years. And again, showing that Satan is not in hell right now. Like a lot of people think. He's not just ruling and reigning in hell with his pitchfork and saying, Aha, I'm the ruler of hell. And I'm going to send forth my demons from hell to go and plague people. No. He actually goes to heaven. He could travel back and forth between the earth and heaven as he, as he will, as he, as he wants to. And, um, but at this point, at, after the battle of Armageddon, he's cast into the bottomless pit. He's cast into hell for a thousand years. Verse number three, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Because that's what he does. He goes around deceiving, tricking people. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years." And I think the reason why th these specific people, it doesn't talk about all saints. This is talking about the people who came out of that tribulation and maintained their faith steadfast to the end. They didn't buckle under pressure. They didn't lie and deny Jesus Christ. They were beheaded. They were, you know, they were martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. I think they're going to be rewarded extra in this millennial reign of Christ and are probably going to have some of the, the best seats. You know, the Bible talks about them that are first or last and them that are last or first. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. These last, I believe, are going to be treated as first yeah. because they go through so much and they maintain their integrity and they maintain their faith and they get martyred for Christ. I think they're going to be kind of at the, at the tops of, of positions of authority. I think that's why this is mentioning this here. I'm not saying that nobody else is going to rule and reign with Christ, but these people specifically, when they go through so much, they're going to be rewarded because the more you do, the more you know, things you go through, you know, you're going to be receiving that much more for what you've done in this earth in your body at the judgment seat of Christ. So you're going to be receiving this stuff, and they, uh, they're going to be put over these um, to rule and reign because Jesus Christ is setting up a kingdom. Now, mind you, when Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, there are a lot of people that have been destroyed. You've had a, a lot of people killed through the wrath of God while he's pouring out his wrath. And then however many people the devil stirred up to actually go and fight in a battle against Jesus Christ are also all wiped out. They're all an eye. They were all killed. But it doesn't mean that every single person on this earth went to the battle. There's still people that, that, you know, didn't go. I'm not fighting for, you know, they, they were there or whatever. Um, and I believe still people that didn't take the mark of the beast. They didn't get to that point yet. They, they, they weren't for, they, you know, they, they got out of it. They didn't do it. They weren't saved, but they didn't take the mark of the beast. They're not fighting his battles and they're still on the earth. Because who else is, I mean, otherwise Jesus, he's going to be ruling and reigning. I mean, he could be ruling and reigning over us, but see, we're going to see why um, there definitely has to be some unsaved people here because we're going to get into the, the battle of Gog and Magog where there's one more time after Satan is released to deceive the nations again. That's why I say he's going to deceive the nations no more until he's released from hell. So once he's released from hell, he's going to go and be that great deceiver again to the nations and do one more battle. So um, before I get too far ahead of myself, Let's finish up here in Revelation 20, verse number five. Uh, but the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So those people, the first resurrection, remember Christ, the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15, then they that are Christ at his coming, that is the first resurrection. 
So the people who took part in that first resurrection, which would also include uh, the martyrs, right, and the people who died for Jesus' sake, not because the only people who are going to be here who are alive until the remaining of Jesus Christ haven't been martyred, right? They're going to be saved from that, but they made it through the tribulation. And people who died just prior to that would be the martyrs. But all of them are going to be part of that first resurrection. And if you're saved today, you'll be part of this first resurrection also, which means that we're going to take part in that first resurrection. It says, on such a second death, that no power. We, have, you know, we don't have to worry about the lake of fire because we're saved, which is, you know, the second, the second death is the, is the lake of fire. It says, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years on this earth. It's exciting. It's something to look forward to. I think that's, that's cool. It's going to be neat. It's going to be interesting how everything <coughs> shapes up. Let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. Now we're going to look at the, the battle of Gog and Magog. And if there's anything that's similarly just, I don't know, I say bastardized or, or just people come up with these weird doctrines. It's Gog and Magog. I mean, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses are so out in left field on the 144,000, you have these prophecy experts, right? Like the TBN type or whatever. He's got these people on TV or they have these newsletters and stuff and they're always trying. It's like, it's like the Alex Joneses of, of religion, right? Of just trying to, you know, every week, every day, it's, Oh, the prophecy is being fulfilled with Iran and Iraq and Syria and Israel and Russia and, you know, I mean, whatever. They're always coming up with something as, see, look, this is, this is the prophecy being fulfilled and the blood moons and everything else, right? Well, Gog and Magog, and they, they always will pick, just like the 144,000, I mean, it's only mentioned twice in the Bible. Guess what? Gog and Magog is only mentioned like twice in the Bible. It's mentioned in Ezekiel, which we're going to turn to, we're going to look at, and it's mentioned here in Revelation chapter 20. So it's an event, it's an important event, but it's not like there's tons of information and details given about this, which is why these people love to run with it and start applying it to everybody in the world as to who this could possibly be. But from the timeline of events, and I'm going to show you this, it's very clear in Revelation chapter 20. Where people get the majority of their false doctrine from is from Ezekiel. Because you can't, you can't argue with Revelation chapter 20. I mean, this is very clearly happening after the millennial reign of Christ. Well, let's, let's keep reading here. We'll get, we'll get this, this Gog and Magog reference in context here. So look at verse number 7, Revelation 20. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So the thousand years are over. Jesus Christ ruled and reigned on this earth for a thousand years. That's ended. And as a result, now Satan is loosed out of his prison. He's loosed out of the bottomless pit. He comes up out of hell. Verse 8, and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So within that thousand years, whoever was left that was unsaved, that made it through the wrath of God, that, that didn't go and participate in the battle, now after a thousand years has been able to repopulate enough to, for Satan to deceive and for the, to amass such a people who are as the sand of the sea. This in itself is, I think, kind of mind-blowing. And it just, I think it just demonstrates once again how some people just do not want to have Jesus in their life. We all have a choice. We all have free will. Some people just do not want to have God ruling them at all. And if, if there's ever a time, because, you know, it's mind-boggling to me, at being a saved person, someone who's already received Christ, to think of how could you be living at the time when Jesus was actually walking on this earth and seeing the miracles and everything else that he was doing and all the good work that he was doing and reject him and, and, and call him the devil and, every, you know, and a lot of the things that the Pharisees were doing and plotting to kill him and everything. That alone is just kind of mind-blowing. Who, who could do that? Who in their right mind would do that? Yet people did it. They rejected him. 
We see in Luke 16, he said, you know, if, when, when the, the, the rich man was, was begging for Lazarus to be brought back, and Abraham said, look, he has Moses and the, they have Moses and the prophets. You know, if they won't listen to Moses, they won't be convinced that even if someone, someone comes back from the dead. And there are people like that. And even after a thousand years of, of Jesus Christ reigning on this earth, I mean, the kingdom is established the way that he wanted it to be from the beginning. There is going to be no war. It is going to be a great time of peace. I mean, it's going to be a time of peace, prosperity. The, the, the righteous government is going to be in charge. Everything that happens is going to be done right. The law of God is just going to be handed out and distributed and, and, and everyone is going to be under that law and it's going to be an amazing time, yet there's still going to be people and not just a small amount of people, but people as the sand of the sea who are willing or who are, who are going to be deceived by Satan and reject Jesus and get into this battle of Gog and Magog. It also shows you how conniving and crafty Satan really is. He, he had just done the same thing a thousand years prior. The Battle of Armageddon. He gathered all the nations together to fight against Jesus. We saw how that turned out. Yet somehow he thinks that this is going to be different. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what tactic he's going to use after being in hell for a thousand years of convincing people, it's going to work this time. We're going to overthrow Jesus. I, I learned from my mistake. This was the error of my ways as he opened up his mouth and everyone just died in front of me. I, mean, what? I found his weakness. I mean, was he going to bring some kryptonite from hell? I don't, I don't know. Like, well, I, well, I don't know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting, but, but, but it's going to happen. Yeah. Whatever he does, people are going to, I mean, whether it be because people just hate Jesus and they don't want to have anything to do with him or because they're just told, I mean, I don't know. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see, but I mean, it's just something to think about how he's going to, how he's going to deceive people. Well, let's keep reading here. Verse number nine. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning for that thousand years, he's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And this is the camp of the saints now. The beloved city is that, that Jerusalem that Jesus is, is ruling and reigning from. And they surround it. I mean, people, this army, this great host, this multitude as the sand by the sea just surrounds the city. And look what happens. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. They didn't have a chance. I mean, not even close. It's not even a battle. They just, poof, done. Same thing that happened with the battle of Armageddon. Verse number 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's when, when God's flying enough and said, Okay, Satan, now it's just time for you to be in the lake of fire and that's where you're going to be forever and ever and ever. And you're not going to be able to deceive anyone ever again anymore. You're going to be tortured and tormented forever, for an eternity. Now, I have all the references. And other than, turn if you want to Ezekiel chapter 38. In Genesis and in First Chronicles, we have mentions of Gog or Magog. And it's just people who were actually born. I mean, that's where names come from. You know, like names of cities and places are, are like always named after somebody. There's someone that had that name and that's what it became. Israel was a person before Israel was a nation, right? I mean, we have a land now called Israel named after Jacob, whose name became Israel. That's, and that's so many places like that. That's, that's the way it works, especially in the Bible. People just name places after them. So we have the people who were born um, and, and the genealogies just, just given. Uh, Magog was one of the sons of Japheth, one of the sons of Noah, Right? And then um, Gog was one of the sons of, of Joel, who has another lineage, and I don't even have that far in my notes. So it doesn't matter, right? I mean, for, for what we're studying tonight. Um, other than that, we've got Revelation 20, which we just read, which is very, very clear. You, you, I don't, 
You can't argue with me that this is taking place at some other time other than after the millennial reign of Christ. There's just too much there. But now you got Ezekiel 38. And actually, I need to turn there also because we're going to read through. Actually, what am I doing? This way. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 and 39 talk a little bit more about the battle of Gog and Magog. Now, as I've always mentioned in the past, when you're looking at the Old Testament references and prophecies, oftentimes there are dual applications. There's things that are going to happen in the short term or locally in an actual physical region at that time in addition to prophesying of end times. Now, in this case, we're going to see that most of this is, is talking about the end times, I believe. But, um, and it even, it even mentions specifically as talking about in the latter days. But let's start reading here in Ezekiel 38, verse number 1. But as the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, it's talking about the chief prince of these places, Meshech, Tubal. Usually when the Bible is talking about the princes of certain areas and locations, especially in Ezekiel and other Old Testament places, it's talking about the, the spiritual force that's in charge of those areas. Just like when Daniel was praying and, and um, is talking about the, the, the prince of Persia and the prince of Medio, these people who are really in charge, it's a spiritual wickedness in high places. You have men in positions of power, but the one who's really pulling the strings is the devil or one of, you know, one of the devils that are, that are really there having the evil influence and, and causing that wickedness. So here we're seeing the uh, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince. So this is the spiritual battle against the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. And I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. And then it lists off Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, um, before I read any further, when it says, I'm going to turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, I believe it's an illustration of the devil and being Satan and being the dragon and using the, 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 the hooks going into your jaws. Uh, I can't remember the reference right now, but um, in, uh, oh, in, uh, in Job, when it talks about the dragon. And it talks about people trying to put the, you know, the leading of bow, putting hooks into his jaw, you're going to draw him out of the great deep, right? Are you going to, you're going to cast angle, you're going to, you know, try to get hooks in his jaws. Um, but God is going to put hooks into his jaws, right? He's going to defeat all of his enemies. So let's keep reading here. I just wanted to, to point that out. Look at verse number six. Gomer and all his bands, thou shalt took armor of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself. Thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. And it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So again, this is talking about the latter years now. I believe this is a reference to the end times. Verse number 9. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Remember we read it was, they had people like the, the sands of the sea, huge multitude. Verse number 10, Thus saith the Lord, It shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Remember, the, the millennial reign of Christ. It's a time of peace and prosperity. There's, you know, the, the, the swords are be beaten into, into, into plowshares. You know, there's gonna be, it's going to be a time where there's going to be no need for weapons. So now they're going to get this evil thought saying, oh, I'm going to go to the, to the, they have no way of, to defend themselves. Because Jesus is ruling. We don't need an army. We have Jesus Christ ruling and reigning, right? And then he says, so in verse 11, thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest. 
that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods, that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil, as thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to, t uh, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day, when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So this is now people, and, and this is why people want to look at Gog and Magog and who's Gog and, and everything else. Because they're looking at this when it says, you're going to come against my people Israel that dwell safely. And they're just thinking of the established place from the United Nations in, you know, in the 1940s that, that that is Israel and that's who this is talking about and not actually God's people Israel at the place that Revelation shed light on Gog and Magog explaining exactly when this is going to happen in the latter days giving us the more information that we need to understand the Old Testament and what it's saying here. So they run with this saying, oh, you know, some, someone's going to be surrounding Jerusalem and Israel and they're going to be fighting against them and stuff. And that's why they're saying maybe it's going to be Russia, maybe it's going to be China, maybe, you know, whatever. And they come up with all these crazy theories because they're only basing it off of Ezekiel. So let's keep reading here. It says, um, verse 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken, in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountain shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. You don't think this is end times events? Like, way end times events? This isn't stuff that's talking about something that's going to be happening like tomorrow in so-called Israel. I mean, it's yeah. verse number, in, in the last verse, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. Um, I, you know what, just for, no, you know what, read this on your own. I don't want to get too far into this. I've got some more things I'd, I want to cover tonight. Read chapter 39 tonight when you go home, because there's just one more reference here. It's, it goes a little bit more in depth on Gog and maybe Gog, but the, the main point I wanted to get across was not to get sucked into the, the, the prophecies and the people having all this information on who's Gog and who's Magog and stuff because this isn't going to be happening in our lifetime except our eternal lifetime, right? <laughs> That's going to be after the millennial reign of Christ and we'll see all this stuff play out. But this is not going to be something that we have to be concerned about. Like, oh, who's Gog? It's going to happen later. And, and Ezekiel 38, I mean, matches it to a T. There is, there is no saying, oh, well, this is a different Gog and Magog event. Anyhow, let's, uh, let's keep going here. Go back, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20. I was going to go through, like, pretty much all of Ezekiel 39 as well, but, I mean, that, that's a Bible study for another day. You, got, you go through that at home. 
Revelation chapter 20. So Gog and Magog, we have Armageddon, which is the battle after the wrath of God is poured out, at the last vial, everything is last poured out. Battle of Armageddon, millennial reign of Christ. God said, you know, Jesus sets up his kingdom. Millennial reign of Christ ends. Satan is loosed out of hell, deceives the rest of the unbelievers on the earth to, to come up and battle against Jesus again. That's Gog and Magog, the four quarters of the earth, brings them to battle. Fire and brimstone come down from heaven and destroy them. Okay. And at that point, Satan now is cast into the lake of fire. And now we're going to see the great white throne judgment. So the millennial reign of Christ is over. Satan, the beast, the false prophet, they're all in the lake of fire. And now it's time for this, the last resurrection. Verse number 11, uh, Revelation chapter 20. The Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, I believe very firmly when it says the books were open, that's talking about the books of the Bible. Because what else are we going to be judged? Or the books of the law of God, which is the Bible, right? Because it says that they're judged according to their works. It says they're judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I've heard some people say like, well, the books are going to be all the things that they've ever done that are sins or whatever. They're going to be judged off that. No, it says the, the books are going to be determining their judgment based on how they live. So the books is the law. It's the standard. It's the, this is what, what we're basing judgment on based on, you know, according to whatever you did. So whatever you did, oh, what does the book say? Oh, you've sinned. Oh, you deserve the lake of fire. And notice that it says that they were uh, the dead. So it says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now, there are times when, the, when people can be referred to as being dead, even though they're saved, if it's talking about their flesh dying, right? Jesus Christ explained that to his disciples when he said that Lazarus sleepeth. Lazarus was saved. He had eternal life. But he's referring to his physical death. So he said, well, Lazarus is dead. But was Lazarus really dead when he's talking about his soul or spirit? No, because he had eternal life. He was saved. But physically, he died. But this is talking about, I mean, everybody's already dead or saved, like, and, and, and ruling and reigning with Christ at this point, because God wiped out everybody that just came against him. And now you've got this great white throne judgment. So when it's talking about the dead, it's talking about people who don't have eternal life. They're not alive. They're dead. Their soul is dead. When you die on this earth without Christ, when you're not saved, you go straight to hell. There is no judgment of God. You just go straight to hell. This is the point. This great white throne judgment is when people are actually going to stand before God now and understand why they've been burning in hell for however long they've been there for. This is the judgment day where they're finally going to realize everything that they did if they haven't figured it out already during the time that they've been in hell. And they're going to stand before God. And it says here that the, uh, verse number 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Again, and this is a very good, um, you know, death and hell. The dead which were in them. The dead that are in hell, they don't have their bodies. They're being brought back up out of hell to stand before God. It says, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the dead, they're resurrected from wherever they are, from hell, 
right? And, and the bodies are coming up from the sea and from everywhere else. They're getting their bodily resurrection. This is the second resurrection. Whereas we got our new bodies, our glorified bodies at the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? This is now where the dead, they're going to be um, reunited, but in a way, in a, in a, in a death body, not in a, not in a glorified body. And they're going to be judged according to their works. And then if you're not in the book of life, which they're not because they're dead, they're cast into the lake of fire. So God's got his, his book of life. Well, I got all the names here. And here's all the works that you, you know, you do all these works. Well, based off of these books, you deserve hell. Are you in the book of life? No? Okay, well, you're going, you're going to the lake of fire. Yeah. And that's what happens at the great white throat judge white throne judgment. And notice it said there in verse 14, it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death is being destroyed or being cast into the lake of fire. Not just hell, but death. And what we read earlier, you don't have to turn it, but in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, the Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This is when death is destroyed. It's after the millennial reign of Christ. So there's still death during the millennial reign of Christ. There's death all the way up until this great white throne judgment where finally death, that last enemy, because the beast, the false prophet, devil, they're all in the, the lake of fire. They're all destroyed. They're all out there. The dead are now being judged and death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. And they're destroyed. That's when the last enemy shall be destroyed. And then in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. This is when Jesus Christ returns back the, the, the power to God, that he's, he's done, his reign is over. And now, and we're going to see that here. Look at Revelation 21. We're going to keep reading here. And it talks about the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, Revelation 21, verse number one says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. This is also going to be relative, pretty interesting how people are going to be judged. Like, is the whole universe destroyed? Is it just, I mean, is it the heaven and the earth? Is it just talking about the one planet or just all of the heavens? I don't know. But, um, and there's another thing that Jehovah's Witnesses don't get, that this earth that we're on is going to be destroyed. This is the old, or I mean, this is, this is going to be gone. There's going to be a new heaven and new earth, so we're not going to be on this earth forever. After this judgment seat, or at this, at this point, is when the, the heaven and earth are fled away, and they're, they're, it says there's found a, no place for them. It's gone. It's all, it's all wiped off. And it's just... I don't know, we're going to be in a vacuum, we're going to be in heaven. I have no idea what the setting is, probably the third heaven where God is, is where all this judgment is going to be taking place, where his throne is. That's, that's what I believe. That's what, the only thing that seems to make sense to me. And then, um, so let's see here, verse number one, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So now he's seeing there's this new heaven, there's this new earth, and out of, out of heaven is the new Jerusalem. The way that, that Jerusalem should have been, we have this heavenly Jerusalem coming down now out of heaven that's going to be inhabited on the new earth. Verse number three, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this is referring to God the Father because Jesus Christ has already ruled, you know, you know, reigned for a thousand years but now the tabernacle of God is going to dwell with man on this earth. And um, it says in verse 14, excuse me, 4, uh, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Th and this is really encouraging because obviously there's going to be painful moments, I believe, when people are being thrown into that lake of fire. Maybe people that you've known or seen, you're going to be witnessing 
people that you've loved in the past that are standing for the, the judgment seat of God, and, and it's going to be a righteous judgment, but it's sad that they're going to be cast away. But at this point, you know, that old earth, the old flesh, everything's going to be gone. God's going to be there to come for you. He's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. And it says there's going to be no more sorrow after that. And, and it truly is going to be a heaven on a new earth, you know, so to speak, of, of a great time of, of no pain. I mean, no physical pains, no, I don't, no emotional pain, no crying, no sorrow. What a great place to be. For the former things are passed away. Verse number five. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. It's a fresh start. Everything is new. Everything is right. There's no more sin. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. There's no more problems. Everything is right. Everything is new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Um, there's a few mentions of the new heaven or, or heavenly Jerusalem. We've got Galatians. I'm not going to read all these for you. There's not a whole lot to, uh, to see there. Um, let's keep reading here in Revelation 21, and we'll close with this. There's a few other mentions of Jerusalem. We saw Jerusalem coming down from heaven in Revelation 21. Galatians 4 says, Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Another reference to that new Jerusalem. And then in Revelation 3, verse 12, the Bible says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the, holy, of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Um, just, just some more references of this new Jerusalem after the great white throne judgment and the new heaven and new earth are created. Verse number nine. Here, Revelation 21. It's the la this is the last section we're going to do and we're done. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the, la of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And the bride of Christ here is referring to the new Jerusalem. It's not talking about people. It's talking about this place, the new Jerusalem. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So I just want to just reiterate that, you know, the, the bride of Christ here is not the church. It's not people. It's this place. It's new Jerusalem prepared as a bride adorn. Um, and we're going to see the adorning here. We're going to read now what it looks like. They actually get a pretty vivid description of what the new Jerusalem is going to look like. Um, verse 12, it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. So there's Twelve gates surrounding the city, three on each day. If you think of it as in terms of a square, I don't know if it's a square or not. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a, you've got the, the three on each side. It says in verse 14, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So it does say it lies four square. I mean, I don't know if there's, obviously there's going to be some probably dimension to it, not just some, necessarily some cube. But um, the dimensions are all the same. Verse number 17, and he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the 
fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh adjacent, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every sever several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. It is another just, just kind of a funny thing, but like, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church, he's about the, the pearly gates, right? And be able to get into the pearly gates, and St. Peter is standing at the pearly gates, you know, allowing people in or not. At this point, the judgment has already happened. St. Peter is not standing at the pearly gates of the New Jerusalem, allowing people access to the New Jerusalem. You know why? Because the gates are all open. And we're going to read that in just a second. It says, verse 22, and I saw, uh, or here, in, uh, verse 21, and 12 gates were 12 pearls, every several was a pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent. It was very beautiful, right? All, very ornate. You have all these various uh, stones, and even the, the streets are just pure gold. Verse number 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Which is also interesting, because on this new earth, apparently there's going to be kings on this earth bring their glory into it that like not everyone will be inhabiting this new Jerusalem because we're going to be inhabiting the new earth and the new Jerusalem is going to be set up and it's going to be this great place but um, you know it says that the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it uh, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's the description of the new Jerusalem. So we see there, the gates aren't closed because they're open by day and there is no night. So the gates are always open. And it says that nothing's going to go in there that maketh a lie. Well, and the reason why nothing is going to get in there is because the reason why we're going to be able to get in there is because even if we have made a lie, Jesus Christ has washed us and cleansed us from all of our sins so that we are pure in God's eyes because they have, those sins have been forgiven us. So um, those, are, those are just some random things. I don't want to say not too random, but the, the kind of the, the last events that are going to be happening uh, after the rapture, not including the plagues of God and a few other things, but, but just in general to kind of maybe help solidify your understanding of the Battle of Armageddon, Gog and Magog, the new heaven, new earth, and the new Jerusalem. So uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your words and the instruction, dear God. We're really looking forward to, uh, to that new heavenly Jerusalem and, and that time when there is going to be, all the tears are going to be wiped away, dear Lord, and that it'll be a time of, of absolute peace and, um, and just no pains, no sorrows, dear Lord. We thank you so much for, um, for loving us enough to, to give us a free pass in the heaven by just simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the amount of love you have for us is, is just unbelievable. And um, we thank you so much for offering that free gift unto us, dear God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.